Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to uh, part three of my Attack the King series. Uh, in the first two videos we looked at um, bishop sacrifices on the squares um, h7 and h6 or h2 and h3 from uh, black's point of view. Uh, in this video we're going to take everything from white's point of view, so we're going to focus on those two squares again, h7 and h6. Uh, but we're going to look at uh, knight sacrifices. Having done bishop sacrifices, it seems uh, only fair to give the other uh, minor piece uh, a role to play here. Um, and we'll see some very typical attacking ideas. The, the first example we have here comes from a game between uh, David Janowski and uh, Simon Winauer. This was played in Vienna in uh, 1896. Uh, Winauer with the black pieces um, is a pretty famous chess player. He's got the uh, the Winauer line and the French defense named after him and also the Winauer gambit that I like to play named after him. Uh, David Janowski maybe not as well known today but uh, quite a strong player from the late 19th and early 20th century uh, and a, a, a contemporary of Akiba Rubinstein and one of his competitors but uh, whereas Rubinstein had a more uh, positional style Janowski was more of a uh, swashbuckling attacking player. So uh, Take a look at the position on the board, and um, I think you can see that the seeds for a kingside attack are uh, are pretty well set here. Notice that uh, white's pieces are all pointing at the king, and uh, and the knights are nearby. The knights, it's important that knights be uh, close to the action. Uh, this bishop over here at c2 is really an attacking piece from, from a long distance, but the knights have to be uh, able to jump in quickly. And uh, even the other pieces that are not directly pointing at the king are uh, in a position to come in pretty quickly. The queen can come out, the rook can lift. Um, so let's uh, watch how the game uh, continues from here. I should say that uh, this position comes from uh, Rui Lopez. Um, Black's play may look a bit peculiar um, with this pawn triangle here, but actually is a pretty common idea in the Rui Lopez. It controls this square, the F... Um, Five square, so this knight isn't coming into f5. Uh, we'll look at some knight f5 uh, positions later on in this video, um, but in this case it's been prevented by this pawn triangle, and this bishop, which came out to uh, e7 earlier in the game, can often get rerouted back to uh, uh, g7. So this is, these are um, typical ideas uh, on the black side of the Rui Lopez, and this is still a defensible position, but right at the moment, uh, maybe Black's pieces are a little bit awkwardly placed. I mean, that's kind of the flip side. Uh, white's pieces look well poised to uh, attack. Um, and uh, Black's pieces, particularly these two knights here, uh, are, are interrupting the uh, lines of defense. Um, and so they, they may be uh, causing a certain amount of uh, tangling in, uh, in Black's position. Anyway, uh, Janowski with the white pieces decides uh, it's time to proceed with the attack and plays the move knight to g5. And typical kind of attacking move. It's not really committing to the attack at this point because uh, it's not uh, sacrificing anything. So it's not an all or nothing move. It's more of a uh, probing move. And that's what you often get in these attacks. Um, sometimes with pieces, sometimes with pawns. You'll throw some pawns forward uh, because those are smaller commitments. You're not, uh, if you lose a pawn, it's, it's not such a big deal. And of course, you're not losing this piece. You're just throwing it forward, probing uh, Black's defenses and, and testing for a reaction. And now uh, Black does need to be careful because of these factors I pointed out, white being well set up for the attack and Black being potentially a little awkwardly placed. And in fact, the defensive move that needs to be played here is knight to f8. And that should hold things together. Black is probably okay with that move, um, showing up these pawns over here. But uh, when our um, perhaps a little bit oblivious to what was going on on the king side or uh, following some preconceived plan that he had, he pushed on with c6. Um, so I guess before I put that move on, I, I should mention that, but that is a, a key uh, component of being a good defender. Uh, you know, you're going to come under attack sometimes and uh, just being aware of when attacks are possible and what the patterns are is going to help you make it, it's going to help make you a better defender. Uh, because if you can be aware of these tactics, you can you can find these defensive moves. So knight f8 is the key idea to defend here. c6 was played, and now we get the uh, the advertised sacrifice. Um, since uh, <clears throat> since I already told you 
what the, what the theme of this video is. You probably don't have any trouble guessing the first move, but uh, maybe you want to think about it. It would be a good point to pause the video and, and uh, see how, how, you can, how well you can calculate the, uh, the follow-up to the sacrifice. Okay, uh, I'm going to start talking about it. So uh, knight takes h7, that's the sacrifice in question. And uh, if black uh, declines a sacrifice, um, let's see, the chess engine is actually suggesting the best move here is uh, to play a5 and just ignore the fact they've lost a pawn over here. But that's, that's basically a losing strategy because you're down a pawn and uh, white's position is, uh, is still fine. He hasn't uh, compromised his position to get this attack. He's just gained a pawn for nothing. So um, uh, in a case like this, if you're black and you want to uh, put up the toughest defense, you know, you might as well take that. <laughs> Unless you see that you're getting mated directly, which is not happening in this case, um, you might as well grab the material and then look for opportunities to uh, defend by giving material back and make your opponent prove that he can really attack. So the second move, queen to h5 check, taking advantage of this uh, pin on the pawn. So that knight sacrifice on h7 did two things. It, uh, first of all, destroyed uh, one of the pawns that's defending the king, so there's now an open line to the king. And secondly, it drew the king into position where it walks into this pin, and now that gave the queen access to the h5 square. So the king uh, went back to g8. And now uh, this is a good point to um, uh, try and figure out the follow-up move. There's really only one move here that, uh, that is good for white. Okay, uh, pause the video if you want some time to think about it. I'm going to give the answer away now. Um, the, the correct move here, and that's what Janowski played, is bishop takes g6. You've got to just uh, continue the attack and remove the rest of the pawn cover. Now, um, at this point, um, Winar played knight to f8, trying to defend that way. But first, let's look at what happens if the bishop is taken. Pawn takes bishop, and uh, queen takes. And now if the king goes to f8, then bishop here is mate. So uh, the king has to go to the h8 square. And then after that, we get queen takes e8 check. And now I'm going to leave it here. But you can see, first of all, that white has gotten the material back. White has got, grabbed a rook for the two pieces he sacrificed and has won a bunch of pawns. So white is material up. And the, the attack is continuing. All of black's pieces are now over on the wrong side of the board and the king is sitting here by itself. So uh, you, can, you can tell that this is not a good position for black and uh, white should win in short order. So um, uh, Winar put up a stiffer defense and I think it's kind of interesting. So I'm gonna follow through the rest of this. He played uh, knight to f8, hitting the bishop. And the bishop just retreated. Uh, it can't really stay there anymore. He went back to c2. And now uh, Winar played rook to a7 defending along the uh, the second rank, which is often a key idea. And this is what you want to do. You want to put up the stiffest uh, resistance you can, make your opponent prove that uh, he knows how to attack. Uh, Janowski continues with bishop to h6. Uh, Winauer continues with his plan of clearing the second rank, or the seventh rank in this case, by playing f6. Uh, Janowski takes, bishop takes back, and now um, Janowski grabs the rook, so he's got some material for his um, <clears throat> for his pains for his attack. He's he's actually equalized the material, but uh, but Winauer still has uh, one or two tricks up his sleeve, and he starts off with this move, Bishop e7, setting up a uh, queen trap. And so uh, what's what's nice about the finish here is that Janowski completely ignores the fact that his queen is about to be trapped and continues with knight h5, just pouring more fuel on the fire. So uh, so Winauer closes the trap. He plays uh, bishop to, I'm sorry, bishop to f7, hitting the queen. The, notice these bishops are defended by the knights, and um, so there's no square for the queen to go to. The queen is, uh, is a dead piece, but uh, Janowski has a move here that wins. There's a couple moves that win, so I won't... Uh, Ask you for a quiz, although if you want to, uh, if you want to pause the video here and think about it, it's it's cool. Um, the move that Janowski played here is rook takes e7, just ignoring the threat to the queen, 
And now, um, just to show you some ideas, there's there's a unavoidable mate here. Um, when I, uh, when I were resigned at this point, but to show a few of the ideas, if uh, if bishop takes queen, then we have the knight coming in, knight to f6 check, and notice that uh, this rook here, even though it's hanging, it's uh, still cutting off all of the escape squares. King to h8 is the only move, and bishop to g7 is mate. So a very pretty mate with uh, bishop and knight supported by the rook. Um, let's see what else. If uh, if the queen is not taken, um, knight d e6 is suggested. This uh, this knight can't be moved. Of course, uh, you're um, <clears throat> if you're not uh, taking the queen, then you're then you're also down material as well as being under attack. But uh, this this wins quite quickly for white as well with the queen coming here to f7, driving the king to the corner. And then, um, let's see, the knight's still guarding that square, but uh, bishop g7 check forces uh, knight takes g7. Notice this bishop here is still guarding the escape square of the king, so the only legal move is knight takes g7, and now queen takes mate. And uh, similarly, there, there are other variations there, but they all, they all end in mate, so uh, when our resign. So that's our first example. Here, let's, uh, let's go back to the beginning. The next position I wanted to look at is taken from a game between uh, Steinitz and De Vere, played uh, in London in 1872. So this is from uh, Steinitz's early days. Steinitz, uh, of course, went on to be the first uh, world chess champion and also uh, developed uh, a uh, positional um, style and a, a way of thinking that was very influential. Um, but in his early days, he was known as the Austrian Morphy, and he had an attacking style. And in fact, he played a king's gambit in this game. So we're going to take a look at the position after 10 moves. Um, oh, De Vere declined the gambit and played bishop to c5, so that's that's why this bishop is out here. Um, and Steinitz has pushed his pawns forward. Notice that the bishop here prevents uh, white from castling, so it's not necessarily an ideal attacking position, but, um, well, take a look at the force that white has gathered around the king. First of all, the queen over here uh, is a dangerous looking piece in proximity. We have a, a knight in close proximity. We have two bishops. Even this bishop, which is not yet uh, moved from its starting square, they're both looking at uh, key squares on the king side. And this pawn, if you want to account attacking force around your opponent's king, you have to take into account this pawn, which is controlling some key squares, and particularly keeps this bishop from coming out to e6 and blocking uh, white's uh, light squared bishop here on that diagonal. So uh, all this is uh, looking pretty good for white, although it is, uh, you know, white is certainly better here, um, primarily because of this uh, advantage in development, but it's not uh, necessarily hopeless. Um, black could defend, uh, perhaps uh, best here is a move like knight d4. Now what de Vere played is uh, knight to b4 with some of the same ideas, you know, counterattacking the c2 pawn, threatening to fork and win uh, some material over in the corner. Um, but knight to d4 is a better way of uh, doing that. So let's let's take a look at the defense first. Knight to d4, hitting this pawn. And if the bishop drops back like in the game, then um, the, the uh, knight is in a position to take that bishop off at a key moment uh, when, uh, when it's uh, dangerously threatening along this diagonal. Uh, actually, the, the recommended continuation is bishop d7 here. And it seems like uh, black is okay. Um, a better line for white, curiously enough, is to play king to d1, defend the pawn this way, and uh, keep keep the bishop uh, on this diagonal and then try and continue the attack from this position. But this is a better defense than what was played in the game. Uh, in the game, I mean, it, it at least won a tempo, forcing the king to move. In the game, uh, knight to b4 was played with the similar idea of attacking this c2 pawn. But now the bishop drops back to b3, defending that pawn and uh, maintaining itself on this uh, fine diagonal. Um, Black continues with bishop d7, trying to get all of his pieces into the game and opening up the, uh, the back rank so the rooks can defend each other. But uh, it's already too late and the sacrifice is possible here. Let's see, Steinitz actually played a6 first, kicking the knight back and then he went for the sacrifice. Um, and if you want to uh, try and calculate the consequences of the sacrifice, this would be a good point to uh, pause the video and think about it. 
Okay, uh, Steinitz played knight takes h7. And once again, um, you might as well take that. In this case, actually, taking the knight is the best move. If you don't take it, you know, you've got to do something about the hanging rook. And then the bishop will come here and take this knight off. And after queen takes pawn, the queen's defending the knight and the king is all exposed. So that loses even more quickly. So king takes h7 is actually the best move here. And uh, how does white justify this attack? What's the next move for white? Uh, actually, I'll just go ahead and play it. There's actually several uh, good moves for white. Um, the one that Steinitz chose is um, bishop to g5, hitting the queen. And now a key point is that uh, f6 cannot be played here because uh, after f6, which you would like to play as black, you want to um, stop these pawns from coming forward. We'll see why in a minute. Uh, queen g6 check drives the king back, and then you can take this knight. And if um, black takes back, then this is mate. So uh, notice that the bishop along this diagonal is guarding the escape square. Very key point. So the bishop can't even be uh, taken back, and uh, so white has recouped the sacrifice piece and is still attacking, and that's uh, that will be a win in short order. So in this position, um, uh, De Vere played queen e8, and uh, that, that's the, the right choice, the best move here, but it's just a, a bad position. The attack continues with f6 now, and uh, that, that's the uh, key idea of the attack, the pressure on the pin knight and then undermining the defense of it. Um, let's see, um, De Vere tried rook to g8, but uh, well, Steinitz just took off, took off that pawn, and after uh, taking back, takes off the knight. The king uh, runs to g8, and then the finishing touch, knight to d5. So a very nice uh, kind of Morphe-like move. This one knight that wasn't uh, participating in the attack finally gets to join in at the end. And notice that even though the knight was sitting here on uh, c3, where it was initially developed, it's really only two moves away from exercising a key role in the attack. So uh, that was uh, that's a key piece. Um, the knight to d5 move could have been played earlier instead of bishop to g5, too, if, in case you were wondering. That was the, one of the alternatives there that was also good. But uh, getting all those pieces into the attack is, uh, is the way to finish the game off. And now there's these threats. Um, knight to f6 check, winning the queen. There's bishop to f6 uh, threatening uh, checkmate here on uh, g7. If the king um, walks away so that the knight to f6 is not check anymore, there's another nice mate here with queen to h8 because the knight is also guarding the escape square of the king. And when the rook comes back to block this check, this bishop can leave off this diagonal, pick up this diagonal, and deliver mate here with the uh, knight guarding the escape square and the rook being pinned. So a very nice finish there. Anyway, uh, after uh, after knight d5, uh, De Vere saw the writing on the wall and resigned. So um, let's see. Let's take a look at the next one. This next position uh, comes from a game between Walter Brown and uh, Jeremy Silman. So uh, Jeremy Silman is, is pretty well known for his uh, books that he's uh, written. And uh, Walter Brown is an American grandmaster who uh, just died last year, but he was a, a strong grandmaster. He um, came from Australia originally, but uh, spent a lot of time away. He, he migrated to America and uh, he played a lot on the West Coast here. And he was uh, active up until uh, up until he died, actually. He played in a tournament uh, the day before uh, he died. So uh, a very dedicated chess player and uh, someone who really enjoyed the game, really enjoyed uh, thinking about it. Uh, let's see, this uh, game started out as a Bogo Indian. We're going to join it uh, pretty far in. We're on move 24. It's, uh, well, it's uh, White's 25th move. Um, and something has already gone wrong for uh, Silman here, Silman with the black pieces. Uh, he's got an isolated queen's pawn position. And normally when you have this, uh, this is sort of a long-term uh, weakness. It'll be a problem in the end game supporting it. Um, although right now it's actually a passed pawn because these uh, the pawns on either side have disappeared. But it appears that black has no compensating activity. In fact, his pieces seem to have been driven back, so maybe that's the main factor. The material is even. He does have this isolated queen's pawn, but the main thing is his pieces have all been pushed back. And notice, once again, that 
all the pieces that are available for the kingside attack. We have both bishops pointing at the king's side, this bishop actually playing a role directly, looking in both directions and blocking this pawn. The queen from afar um, reinforcing the bishop and looking out on the king's side, and the two rooks standing by, ready to join in. And uh, Walter was a great attacking player as well. He started off with uh, knight f5. And so I, I wanted to introduce this knight f5 idea. This f5 square is a great square for the knight, particularly after your opponent has played the h6 move. So you're, you're hitting two pawns, and there are ideas of sacrificing the knight either on g7 or on h6 to uh, open up lines to, uh, um, to attack the king here. Um, now, let's see. A, a defensive move is in order here. Um, the best defense, according to the chess engine, is uh, something like rook to c6, lifting the rook and trying to defend along the sixth rank here. Uh, a little bit tricky. You might be tempted to just trade off this knight since I told you what a terrible piece it is. And that, that is a move that can be played here. Uh, wasn't played in the game. Um, but it's not actually the best move here. Uh, now the rook could come to c6. But maybe it, it would um, maybe black would last a little longer. But it's kind of a uh, positionally suspect move because now uh, uh, black, in addition to having the um, the isolated queen's pawn has also got, uh, uh, he's given up the bishop pair, so uh, white has a pretty significant uh, edge here. Um, so anyway, if someone tried to uh, keep the bishop pair, or at least not give the bishop pair to his opponent by uh, playing the move bishop to e8. But, uh, well, this move is just a mistake, and it allows uh, Walter to show uh, some of his attacking skills. So he starts off by trading, gets rid of that bishop, and then he goes for the sacrifice right away. Knight takes h6. So maybe before I put that on the board, you could uh, think about uh, the follow-up and see if you can figure out uh, some kind of continuation here. This one, I think, is pretty straightforward, so uh, why don't you just see if you can calculate it out. Um, let's see. So knight takes h6 was played. And, um, you know, when I said it was straightforward, um, there's actually a kicker at the end of the sequence, which often happens. Um, this part is good anyway. He took, let's see, actually, uh, in this case, the chess engine is saying the better part of valor is to run here, uh, king to f8, but white still has a winning uh, advantage at that point anyway. So anyway, someone grabbed the challenge. He took the knight, queen to g6 now. I'm sure you saw that follow-up. And once again, we have the case that if the king comes to f8, this dark squared bishop comes in here and delivers checkmate. So the king has to go the other way, which means you get another pawn with check. King goes back, and you get back to this square with check. And the king goes to uh, h8. And so, uh, well, you've gotten two pawns for your piece, and the king is all exposed. And it uh, looks like should be uh, a win here. So if you got this far, you can give yourself some credit. But right at this point, um, there's a, a, a really nice move and a key idea. So uh, if you can find the move right here, uh, this would be a good point to pause the video and see if you could find the move. Okay, I'm going to give the answer away. There's actually two moves. I think the, the best move is the one that Walter played, uh, bishop to d4, pinning the knight and unleashing this rook on the e-file. And uh, both those effects are important. You could get the similar uh, effect by playing bishop g5, pinning the knight this way, and also unleashing the uh, unleashing the rook on the f-file. But the bishop d4 is a slightly better move. It's a more solid pin, and uh, and there's no way to uh, answer this effectively. Uh, notice that um, if um, the, the the knight is under attack and can't be moved, so it needs to be defended. And um, if you try to defend it with um, this other rook, for example, lifting it up, then the threat is to take this rook with check. Actually, that would win the whole queen. But in general, let, let's, let's leave that idea off. In general, the idea is rook takes rook, queen takes rook, leaves this knight undefended, and so it can just be taken. So uh, rook to f8 is, is practically forced. Get the rook away from where it can be taken and support that knight. But now um, Walter can just pile up the pressure on that pinned piece, very straightforward. And rook to c6 was an attempted defense, so it can't be taken immediately, but the reply was just rook 
A to E1, and uh, Silman resigned. There's no, there's no further defense for the knight. Um, this, this rook can just be taken, and the, the next rook can come in. And, uh, and when this knight goes, uh, it's the last, uh, the last uh, shred of defense for the king because it's sitting there behind, uh, behind that um, a knight just waiting to be attacked. So uh, Silman resigned at this point. The next position was taken from the game uh, Kasparov Amira, played in uh, Buenos Aires in 1992. Kasparov with the white pieces. Let's uh, move ahead to move uh, 18 here. It's uh, Black's turn to move. White's a little better off. That's uh, Kasparov. Um, notice uh, the pawn structure is pretty symmetrical. Pair, one pair of uh, minor pieces, two pairs of minor pieces have been traded. So you might not think uh, there's a whole lot of potential for an attack, but let's uh, watch how Gary manages to cook one up. Now, um, it's not uh, a losing position yet for Black, but Black is in a bit of trouble just because... Um, there's some dangerous uh, looking pins here. Um, all of White's pieces are pretty actively placed and, uh, and Black's pieces are, are somewhat uh, passively located, so he's not, not in good shape here. Uh, rook to c8 is maybe the best move here, uh, pinning the bishop and activating this last piece that's not really participating. Um, Amira tried the move bishop to d6. Okay, let's put that on the board. and. Um, this is not a good move. It allows Kasparov to uh, uh, maneuver his pieces with tempo, and uh, he jumps on this chance right away. He uh, drops the knight back to e3. That's a tempo because it uh, hits the bishop. Now, uh, Amura played bishop to c5, repositioning that, and then knight to f5. So we see once again this knight f5 idea, placing this knight on a, a really excellent uh, attacking square, hitting both of these... Uh, pawns, the pawns on g7 and uh, h6. So now Amira plays uh, rook to c8, but already um, it's uh, a position where uh, the sacrifice can be played. So if you want to uh, take a look at this position, see how you imagine the, the sacrifice would play out in this case. Okay, I'm going to uh, show it. Uh, Kasparov takes on h6. Knight takes h6 check, we get uh, g takes, and the queen comes in here to g6. So once again we see the power of the bishop on this diagonal, pinning the uh, f-pawn and allowing the queen entry. So the king is forced over to h8, there's queen takes h6 check, and then um, there's a couple of interesting maneuvers from this point. Um, the, uh, the chess engine is suggesting that the best move here is actually bishop to d3, and I thought this was kind of an interesting continuation. Kasparov had another idea, which is also winning, so that often happens when you see a winning continuation, you just go for it. But let, let's take a look at this bishop d3 idea. Um, you know, my first thought with bishop d3, you know, obviously it threatens mate, but uh, black can block the mate with this uh, pawn push. Just put this pawn up to um, f5. But this has a problem in that when the pawn comes forward, um, black has given up control of the g6 square again. The queen can come back here to g6 check, drive the king to the corner, and then just uh, lift the king up. A very simple plan. And now the rooks are coming over to deliver mate on the uh, open h file. And so that's game over there. Um, there are other continuations. I just wanted to show that idea. Anyway, the idea that Kasparov went for was... Uh, Going back to g6 with the queen, checking again, still leaving the bishop here and taking advantage of that pin, driving the king uh, back to h8, and then maneuvering the queen like this. The queen checks from h5, king has to go to the g-file, and finally the queen checks from g4. And that was Kasparov's idea, because now the queen is uh, forking the king and the knight. And so um, after king h6, um, just rook takes... And uh, it's uh, pretty much game over here. Let's see, queen e8 was played, and now king g2, lifting up the king and opening up an avenue for the uh, rook to come over. And Amira resigned. It's actually uh, made in three at this point. So uh, nice, nice tactics from uh, Gary. Now let's go back. 
The last uh, position I wanted to take a look at is uh, taken from a game between Alexander Elechin and Savielli Tartikover. This was played in Hungary in 1927. Elechin, of course, was the uh, world chess champion, and Tartikover was a famous uh, player and writer, uh, composer of many witty uh, sayings about the game, um, and uh, quite a good player as well. So let's um, pick it up at move 13. Elechin, with the white pieces, has just castled to the queen side. And you can see he's really um, got an excellent setup for a kingside attack. Notice all his uh, long-distance pieces are over here, but they're all pointed at the kingside, controlling key squares and uh, diagonals. His knight, once again, is occupying the famous f5 square, and the other knight is there as, uh, as a backup. It's ready to jump in quite quickly. And uh, we see that white, in general, has a tremendous edge in development in this position. Um, Tartikover still has a couple of pieces on the back rank that are not yet playing. Um, the chess engine suggests that the best way to proceed here is actually to trade off that dangerous knight, although um, uh, the, there is going to be the knight taking back and uh, there's still going to be quite a bit of pressure. But that would be the um, probably the safest course and black could uh, try and continue that way. Instead, um, Black played, Tartikover played the move bishop to a6, hitting the queen, and hoping to um, trade off this um, this light-squared bishop on this dangerous diagonal looking at h7. So if he can uh, get away with that, then, uh, then Black would be uh, perhaps in good shape. But uh, there's a nice move that uh, Alekhan finds. I'll go ahead and put it on the board because I want you to uh, take a look at this position after that uh, move. Knight h6 check because this is a, um, a great example of uh, a, a good example to calculate from. There's, there's, there's just a whole bunch of different uh, checkmating motifs and attacking motifs uh, encompassed in this one position. So this would be a great position to, to stare at for a long time and see how deeply you can calculate. Can you figure out how the game would proceed from here and uh, what the best moves would be for both sides? Okay, I'm going to uh, give the answer away now. Well, there's three legal moves for black, so we can start with that. Uh, we can eliminate the move king f8 right away because queen takes f7 is checkmate. Um, but you might not have noticed that uh, there's also a mate if the king goes to h8. And um, so if you want to see if you can figure out that that uh, checkmate, uh, this, would be a, this would be another good place to uh, stop. Um, it's a famous mating pattern. Okay, let's let's go ahead and show that one. King to h8. We get um, knight takes f7 check. You might think um, this is good just to win the queen, but of course keep in mind that uh, your queen is still under attack over here. White's queen is. Now the idea is that uh, the king has to come back and now it gets hit by this double check. Um, he runs to the corner because once again king f8 is mate. And now we get the famous smothered mate. The queen comes in, forces the rook to defend, and then knight to uh, to take the queen, and then knight to f7 is mate because the f7 square is unguarded. So a very nice uh, smothered mate. So um, Tartikover didn't go for either of those. He played uh, g takes h6, a natural move here. And now uh, you should see the idea of the combination. The uh, this uh, file has been cleared, and now the uh, the bishop can come over here with check, exposing an attack on the queen. And after knight takes bishop, we have queen here check, because uh, you have to remember this queen was under attack the whole time, so all this has to run with check. You have to clear your queen with check from its uh, position, and then at the end you're going to take the queen. So the king goes to h8, and now rook takes d8, rook takes d8. So if we pause right here, actually um, white has given up too much material for the queen. You might, you might wonder if this was really best play for white um, because white sacrificed a rook and two minor pieces for the queen and the queen is, uh, is not worth that much. So white is uh, down material here. So uh, the key thing 
about this position is that there's one more move. That's why this is a great calculation exercise. If you can uh, go back to that position where knight h6 was played and calculate ahead to this position and then find the move here that is winning for uh, winning for white. And uh, the move that Alec, and actually there is more than one winning move, but uh, really all you need to do is find one. The move that Alekhan found in this position was queen to e4, taking advantage of something that we noted in the beginning, the fact that, uh, that uh, black's pieces are not uh, completely developed here, and so the rook is loose in the corner, and um, there's no good way to defend it. <laughs> the, uh, the knight has to move in order to defend the rook. Um, knight to c6 was played here, uh, which just gives another piece, and then Alekhan is up material. If uh, knight to d7 was played, then um, the uh, the bishop is also hanging. So knight to d7, queen takes e7. So it's a fork between the loose uh, rook and the loose bishop. The game went uh, knight to c6, queen takes c6, and uh, well, the game went on for a while. But Alekhan is up material this point. At this point, he's he's got a material edge, and the uh, and Black's king is somewhat exposed, so uh, not too difficult for uh, Alekhan to uh, wrap this up. Okay, and uh, that wraps up this video. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Leave any comments you have in the section below, and I will be back uh, soon with uh, part four. See you then.